Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for Frankly Speaking About Clinical Trials, facilitated by Dr. Bordoni with Georgia Cancer Specialists and moderated by Anila Lakandwala with Northside Hospital. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. Welcome everyone to today's program, frankly speaking about clinical trials with Dr. Bordoni and Anila Lakandwala. I'm Katie Armsby, the Program Outreach Director with Cancer Support Community Atlanta. If this is your first time joining a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we do welcome you and we invite you to visit our website, cscatlanta.org, where you can see all the virtual programs offered. Those include virtual support groups led by mental health professionals. We have a wide variety of support groups available for both those diagnosed with cancer and caregivers or family members and friends. And then we also have some stress reduction classes like yoga, Tai Chi, and those are all held virtually. And if you ever miss a live program of those, you can find the recording up on our website. We host monthly nutrition seminars facilitated by an oncology dietitian with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. And we also offer a monthly cooking demonstration. And then of course, education programs like these. So again, if you ever miss any of our live programs, please visit the video tab of our website and you can find a full list of recorded events. So if you're interested in additional information on registering for those programs, um, you can please visit the calendar tab of our website, and again, that's cscatlanta.org. I'm excited to welcome today's program moderator. Anila Lakandwala joined Northside Hospital 11 years ago as an oncology nurse. In 2013, Anila joined the Central Research Department and worked as a GYN oncology research nurse, where she was responsible for the clinical trials enrollment and coordinating care for GYN oncology research patients. Two years later, she joined the Phase I and Sarcoma program and served as a clinical research nurse. She was later promoted to research operations coordinator. As an ROC, she worked closely with Dr. Bordoni and her responsibilities included the enrollment and coordination of high acuity oncology patients. Since 2019, Anila has been working as a research nurse manager in the Central Research Department with Northside Hospital, where she specializes in the implementation of research operations and oversees the administrative functions over 13 research clinics throughout Georgia. So with that, welcome back, Anila, to this virtual platform. We're happy to have you and Dr. Bordoni back, and I will pass it off to you to begin today's presentation. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Katie, for the introduction. I would like to welcome all our attendees, and I'm glad that we have a virtual platform like this uh, that we can utilize and discuss information uh, that is useful for you. So um, thank you very much for arranging uh, for uh, in a platform like that. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Bardoni. Dr. Bardoni is a board-certified medical oncologist with Georgia Cancer Specialist. He is the director of clinical research and the leader of the Phase One clinical trials program at Georgia Cancer Specialist. He is a member of the Northside Hospital Cancer uh, Institute Lung Cancer Research Subcommittee and the chair and founder of the Atlanta Precision Oncology Symposium. Dr. Bardoni is the founder and ex-chair of the annual Atlanta Lung Cancer Symposium. His clinical interests include lung cancer, head and neck cancer, and clinical research. Uh, so Dr. Bardoni, I would like to turn it over to you and let you start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anila. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, the audience, for uh, coming to this meeting. About a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, we had a similar program <clears throat> for some of you that uh, participated of that prior program. Uh, you will find actually some updates. Some other information will be probably familiar to you because it was shared with you last time. The following slides were medically reviewed by Dr. Brad Hirsch in February 2019. Additions and updates were made in 2020 and were reviewed by Eukarya Bortman. This program is developed by Cancer Support Community. The program actually was developed, the content of the program independently, and it has been reviewed actually by outside medical and psychological experts. Cancer Support Community, however, has the final control over the content of the program 
and the presenter, meaning me, uh, I was engaged by the cancer support community Atlanta. I don't have any financial relationship or affiliation to disclose, and I'm not being paid by Pfizer, Novartis, and BMS, who are sponsors of the program today. So this is uh, some of the topics that we plan to cover during this uh, workshop. So the first one, of course, is the definition of what clinical trial is. And of course, you are going to find different definitions. One of them is a clinical trial is a research study that compares a new treatment or approach to the existing standard of care, the best treatment based on available evidence. So there are a couple of elements that I want to, um, uh, you know, uh, mention for you. First of all, there is a new treatment. That is actually what we usually call the experimental agent. Second, the experimental agent is usually uh, compared with the standard of care. And usually the standard of care is the best treatment available uh, at that point in time. And finally, we know there is the best treatment available because of evidence. So everything that is done under research or clinical trials is evidence-based. Why to do research? Well, first of all, let me tell you what are the areas of research in oncology or cancer? Prevention. In the area of prevention actually are patients that may have high, low, or a standard risk to develop different type of cancers. What we do is some type of screening, et cetera, to prevent the development of cancer. Of course, actually sometimes the cancer is developed by the time we start the surveillance or the screening. So that patient, uh, the most possible, uh, we need actually to diagnose them when the cancer is early, as early as possible. In that case, actually the chances to cure the patient with the least invasive procedures is highest. And finally, treatment, clinical trials. And the treatment of clinical trials or the clinical trials for treatment are both for advanced, but also for early stage disease. For early stage disease, we still actually have chances to cure the patient from the condition. And we have the chance to reduce the risk of the cancer from coming back or recurrence or relapse. For advanced disease, in general, advanced disease these days cannot be cured. So what we try to do with the intervention in these um, advanced stage clinical trials is to improve survival, to make the patient live longer, but also live better by controlling as much as possible the side effects or the adverse events associated with the experimental treatment. And finally, many clinical trials are based on quality of life, improvement of the quality of life of the patient by, like I said before, reducing the side effects from the treatment. Now, this is a quote from Sandra Swain. Dr. Swain was the president of ASCO, our American Society for Clinical Oncology in 2012. So only objective way to make progress in cancer is through cancer research. And she quote, dramatic trends and the progress we are making would have been unthinkable with the, without cancer research. So just to give you some examples, cancer survival has improved. In the 70s, for instance, this is our baseline, one in two patients or about half of the patients live five or more than five years from the time of the diagnosis. More recently, two out of three people in the years 2000 in the US live five years or longer after the cancer is diagnosed. So there is a significant improvement in cancer survival. If you want to analyze the data in a different way, you can actually talk about cancer death has decreased significantly close to 20% since the early 1990s. So we are talking just a quarter of a century or less. In the 1800s, 1900s, 25 years in the field of uh, you know, medicine in general, and oncology in particular, it was nothing. For us now, it's an eternity. We accomplished so much in just months sometimes in the 
uh, clinical trials in the investigation of cancer through clinical trials. So in terms of quality of life, there has been a significant improvement so individuals, cancer survivors can live active, fulfilling lives with fewer side effects from the treatment. Dr. David Carbone is a very accomplished uh, investigator in the field of cancer. And this is a quote from him. I firmly believe that the best care for people with cancer is care receiving in a clinical trial. So I try to offer that option to every one of my patients. And that is true. Every one of the patients should be offered the option. Many of them may not qualify, but it doesn't mean that we uh, shouldn't try to offer the option to the patients. So these are some of the examples of the improvement in the uh, management of cancer in the last few years, in the last maybe 15, 20 years. In terms of patients with advanced melanoma, I remember in the 90s and even the early 20s, it was a struggle. Advanced melanoma actually with a sentence for the patient. Now, over 40% of the patients achieve long-term remission. It's not because of the introduction of chemotherapy. We try chemotherapy and some other biomodulators, the interferon, interleukin, et cetera, in the past. More recently, is through immunotherapy as a single agent or combination and also target therapy in a reduced part of the melanoma population. For lung cancer, patients with advanced disease live longer. And one more time, it's not because of the traditional chemotherapy intervention, but the intervention with target therapy and immunotherapy. And again, this actually had taught us for melanoma and for lung cancer in particular, that these diseases are not just one disease. So the treatment is not one uh, fit all. In this particular case, as we know lung cancer is many. So far, actually more than 30 different diseases, and they should be treated different through target or immunotherapy. There are blood cancers, meaning lymphoma, myeloma, and leukemias. T-cell-based therapy accomplished these days 90% remission rate. Please don't get uh, confused with cure rate. 90% is remission rate. Unfortunately, some of these patients will relapse. The treatment, however, can be repeated. Pediatric cancers. Cancer in uh, children have become a model, a model in general for oncology and for the development of clinical trials. About 80% of uh, children with cancer are cured. This time, actually, cure is the term in uh, true cancer uh, treatment. And finally, breast cancer. Adjuvant therapy for early stage and treatment for metastatic disease have significantly improved the survival rate, many times of very young patients. Who should participate in clinical trials? Well, let's start by making this statement. This is the bad news. Less than 10% of all cancer patients take part in a clinical trial. Most of them, and this is another bad news, are white men. We would like more percentually participate in clinical trials and beyond just white and men participants. So underserved populations, unfortunately, they need a better representation. Whatever conclusion we draw, from the participation of white men in clinical trials can sometimes partially and sometimes cannot be extrapolated to minority patients. Just let's give us an example. In 2018, more than 5,000 patients participating uh, participated in clinical trials that led to the approval of 17 new cancer drugs. But look at the abysmal a participation, 68, almost 70% of the patients were white, 15% were Asian, and the very low 44% African-American participation, while African-American makeup in our country is 13% of the population. The same for Hispanics, 4% participated, while Hispanics make up 
16% of the US population. So we need to increase, we need to encourage minorities to participate in clinical trials. So we draw conclusions that are specifically applicable to them. Let, let me give you an example about immunotherapy. All of you probably are aware this is a relatively new successful modality of treatment for cancer. Less than 4% of the people that took part in the clinical trials that led to the approval of the immunotherapies in general to treat different types of lung cancers were African-American. However, more than 4%, unfortunately, of African-American are affected by this condition. Now, why uh, minorities do not participate in clinical trials? Well, there are different reasons. One of them is the lack of trust. There is a history of discrimination around the world in general, in our country in particular. But things have changed radically and things actually changed since the 70s, not a long time ago. However, it's more than half a century. The lack of proper medical care. So sometimes actually the physicians, we are the responsibles to introduce the patients, our patients, with the option of clinical trials. We may fail to do so. That is what I mean by lack of proper medical care. Language barriers. Many times actually people with an accent, with different background in terms of education, etc., may not communicate well. And then actually if the patient is not able to understand the uh, you know, the significance of the clinical trial, the risk of the clinical trial participation, etc. Unfortunately, they cannot participate. Education limitations, of course, understanding, like I said before, what the clinical trial is all about. And finally, underlying health conditions. Patients may have comorbid conditions, heart, lung, etc. And some of these conditions, unfortunately, exclude patients from clinical trial participation. Unknown new uh, experimental drugs cannot be given to patients at the beginning during very early phase clinical trials if we don't know exactly what the side effects may be. There are some financial limitations. Sometimes actually to participate in the clinical trial, patients and families, they need transportation from miles and miles from the research center, poor pay jobs, excess expenses due to clinical trial participation is something actually that we're aware of and we try to help patients through foundations. So in terms of lack of participation, one more time, these are examples. Highest cancer death rate in USA, USA is in african Americans, and you saw. 4% participation in clinical trials. Leading cause of death, Asian Americans, and you saw actually the participation is less than 20%. Higher incidence of living cancer in Hispanics, you remember the participation as low as 4%. Highest incidence of colon cancer, American Indian and Alaskan natives. These are people actually that are relatively marginated in the society and uh, of course, the participation in clinical trials. And finally, breast cancer. The highest risk of dying from breast cancer is in African-American, both women and men, but in particular women. So all these minorities, we need to do as much as possible to make them participate in clinical trials to benefit from the participation. So how clinical trials work? There is what we call preclinical and then clinical research. The preclinical research is when a new drug or agent undergoes extensive testing in the lab and is to evaluate mainly the activity, but sometimes also the toxicity. The activity in cell lines. We culture cancer cells in the lab. We add to the culture media some kind of experimental agent and we see what kind of reaction the cells have. Animal models, we can inject uh, cancer cells, we can develop tumors in the animals, and then we can treat the animals to see what about the activity and the toxicity of the experimental agents. Now, from the clinical research standpoint, 
they are divided in phases. The first one is the phase one trials. This is the time actually the experimental agent first go to humans from the animal model. The population in general phase one clinical trials are small group of patients with different kinds of cancers. The goal is mainly to evaluate safety. We are not looking much about uh, efficacy, response, but safety. We want to make sure the experimental agent doesn't hurt the patients. This is an example. This is a, an agent that was recently approved this year by the FDA just for one application. Probably has more than one application and the FDA is evaluating now some other applications, in particular in lung cancer, but the application most likely will go beyond lung cancer. This is the study of an experimental agent that is called amivantama. This is a monoclonal antibody. Many of you are um, very familiar with antibodies or monoclonal antibodies. This is, however, not a monoclonal, but a bispecific antibody. Bispecific because it targets two targets, EGFR1 and the other CMEC. You can see down there the cartoon of the bispecific antibody. Is this in green and purple? And you can see the green targets the EGFR receptor and the purple target the MED, that is the second target. So what happened? You know, actually patients with lung cancer, about 17% in the population of this country, they develop advanced lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and they carry a mutation. The cancer cells carry what we call EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor mutation. Those mutations mainly happen in exon 19 and 21 of the EGFR gene. We expose those patients to the first line treatment. The first line treatment is called osimertinib. It's a drug that is approved, is in the market, and the brand name is Tagriso. Now, after the pressure of treatment with osimertinib, cells are intelligent. Cancer cells, I mean. <coughs> they develop mutations. And the mutations actually are different ones. EGFR dependent, MED dependent, and other pathways dependent mutations. So after the patient tumor progresses under the pressure of the first line osimertinib, they are trying to develop some other drugs to continue treating the patient and continue the efficacy. This is the phase one, the experimental part one of this clinical trial. <coughs> the experimental agent amivantamab was treated as monotherapy, as a single agent or in combination. And I apologize because in this, um, on the left side of the screen, in this uh, box is supposed to be actually the eligible population. And I mentioned EGFR mutations in exon 19 and 21 or L858R. And I left out exon 20. Exon 20 until recently was very difficult to treat. Exon 20 also was um, a population of patients with this kind of insertion mutations that were also part, a very important part of this clinical trial. The clinical trial allocated all these patients to three different groups, the red, the blue, and the green. The red, first of all, as you can see actually is the infusion of the experimental agent as a single agent IV. And they started actually with this dose, 140 milligrams. This dose probably came from the animal model, the tolerance in the animal model. And they did actually what is written down here, dose escalation until maximum tolerate, tolerated dose. So, they start increasing the dose from 140, maybe to 280, 360, et cetera, until they find that patients cannot tolerate because of the toxicity. And again, one more time, this is not a matter of efficacy, it's a matter of toxicity. And then they get to the point that they obtain what they call the RP2D or the recommended phase two dose. So when we get actually to the RP2D, the clinical trial then is ready to move into the next uh, phase, from the phase one to the phase two. 
The primary endpoint, again, one more time for this phase one clinical trial was safety. Now, this is now the phase two. What is the end goal of the phase two clinical trials? Obtain efficacy data. So we know about safety. We continue learning about safety, but the main reason for phase two clinical trials is efficacy. The population is larger than the phase one trials and the length until we draw conclusions is about two years average. There are some randomization in some phase two clinical trials, but not all of them has to be randomized. Randomized mean the allocation of patients to different treatment approaches or arms. So this is the same clinical trial we were talking about. This is the same population. Now patients went through phase one, we discovered the optimal phase two dose for these patients and the clinical trial evolved into what they call cohort expansion or sometimes phase two. This time actually the patients were allocated to two different cohorts. One of, the, one of them was amivantamab by itself and the other one was amivantamab IV plus lazertinib that is an oral agent. Lazertinib is very, very close to Tagriso or Osimertinib. The primary endpoint here in the phase two, as you can see, is response rate. And we want to be very objective. So we use a very specific form to evaluate the response called RESIS criteria. The secondary endpoint is biomarkers of response, and we are not going to get, to get into that today. In any case, these are some of the results. And the results actually are expressed in response rate. As you can see, the response rate was not that high. It was 36% of the patients. We are talking actually a small number of patients, but this is the essence of these clinical trials using target agents these days. It's a proof of concept. If a good number of patients respond to the treatment, then we can extrapolate this data to a much higher number of patients, and we don't need to perform other bigger clinical trials before the FDA approve the drug. Now, MDR, MDR means median disease response, and this has not been reached. So even when 40% of the patient responded, they responded for a very long period of time. And this, of course, is very important. Know how many respond, but for how long. And finally, there are the phase three clinical trials. The primary end goal is to differential efficacy, to compare the efficacy. As I said at the beginning in the definition, a promising experimental agent is compared with a standard of care, usually the best we have at the point the clinical trial goes into effect. The secondary endpoint is still safety. We always continue looking for safety. And the ultimate goal is FDA approval. These are large studies. They involve hundreds or even thousands of patients. Execution site, academic and community-based cancer centers. Northside Hospital Cancer Institute and we, Georgia Cancer especially, associated with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute are very active in performing these clinical trials. The randomized design is common. A statistical measure specifically defines the parameters of what is a successful or a failed clinical trial. So to evaluate efficacy, we look for the response, meaning the by objective parameters, the decrease in the size of the tumor, if the tumor can be measured by size. The overall survival, how long the patient survived from the introduction or the enrollment in the clinical trial. The progression-free survival or PFS is a very important, mainly these days, with the kind of new treatments that apply to clinical trials. And it means how long does it take from the time treatment starts until the cancer begins to grow again. It doesn't mean actually that the treatment is totally uh, you know, it's a failure at that point. Sometimes these days, we continue using the same treatment, but maybe with a tweak by the addition or some changes in the original treatment. 
And then um, the disease-free survival, that is how long does it take before there is evidence that the cancer has recurred or metastasized. So this is an example. And this is looking at overall survival as safety data from a phase three called Alex. We like to, you know, uh, give a name to the clinical trials so it's easier for us to identify them. This is first line alectinib, the experimental agent versus crizotinib, another experimental agent. And that is in untreated advanced lung cancer patients with a specific genomic aberration that is called ALK. So patients with a stage 3B and 4, ALK positive, those patients with good performance status and no prior treatment for advanced disease were randomized into the uh, alectinib agent, BID, 152 patients. This is the experimental arm and crizotinib, 250 BID. This is the standard of care, the best we had before. This is the control arm and the results are expressed like this. Survival for one and the other agent, for instance, year three. Year three, 67% of the patients on the alectinib arm were um, surviving the advanced cancer versus 57% in the control arm. Year five, 62.5 versus 45.5 almost 20% difference between the old and the new agent. There is no question the old agent probably is never again going to be used, at least in first line in this kind of situation and for these patients. The new agent with a better outcome is now actually considered the standard of care. This is another way to express the results, the progression-free survival, and you can see the dismal difference between the new, almost 35 months versus the old, 11 months. Sydney, like Three times months. better progression-free survival. The HR means Hazel ratio. is the statistical analysis between the experimental and the control arm. And this small number is very statistically significant. The five-year survival, again, 62 versus 45%. We saw these numbers before, a very significant improvement in five-year survival. And this is the median survival, has not been yet reached and evaluated for the experimental agent. When it's 57.4 months, we know that for the old one. So again, this is the way um, the you know, research in cancer, in the management of cancer progresses through the implementation of well-designed and performed clinical trials. So this is phase four clinical trials. The objective of this phase four is for the evaluate efficacy and uh, side effects or toxicity in the real world once a drug is already FDA, FDA approved. Now, where these clinical trials are performed, and this is actually a Shannon is a patient, is a patient with a stage four cancer of the thymus. This cancer of the thymus is very rare. And the patient is now in remission after immunotherapy that um, is not even now a standard of care. So this is actually her quote. We knew from the beginning that a clinical trial was the way to go. My cancer is rare, it's very rare. And I was diagnosed with a stage four disease, meaning metastatic, advanced. The standard therapy didn't offer much hope. We started looking right away and were willing to go anywhere where they had trials for my cancer. <clears throat> so this is one of the extreme. The patient actually being very proactive, probably was advised by the primary care physician or the medical oncologist. The first step actually during this journey is that every cancer patient should talk to his or her doctor about clinical trials as an option. The second step, when the patient is presented with a clinical trial, is the execution of the informed consent. Sign the informed consent before beginning the study, after discussion of the trial details, and after all patient questions have been answered. This is very important. If you believe there is any red flag 
after reading the informed consent with all the details of the clinical trial, you probably need to continue discussing participation with your doctor. Patients to have proper time to think about the tri trial participation. And the third step, request sharing of trial results if available at any time and stop participating in a clinical trial at any time. These are rights of the patient. Share of the result and uh, stop participation. And we don't have the right to ask if the patient doesn't want to tell us why they want to stop participation. So how do you uh, participate in a clinical trial? We said already, talk to your doctor and you can do an online search. How? By going actually to the websites of cancer centers, participating in clinical trials, by looking for NIH, National Institute of Health, sponsored clinical trials, or by looking at this website, clinicaltrials.gov. So when you search for a clinical trial, you need to be as specific as possible. Specific in terms of the cancer type, the stage, any genetic information or genomic information also as possible. Even then, it can be very hard and confusing. So again, one more time, sometimes the terms are very technical. There is complicated language. So you need to be very specific about eligibility requirements or otherwise in the square uh, below in the bottom actually of the slide, talk to your doctor before to further explore uh, trial options or trial participation. This is the husband and caregiver, Mark, talking about the disease of his wife. My wife was a market researcher, so a very educated person and very good at finding information online. But we were totally confused when we searched for clinical trials for uh, her triple negative breast cancer. So we took what we found to our doctor. And this is very common practice these days. Patients and families are very proactive. They come the first time to the office with a lot of information. And I love that and really relied on her to separate real possibilities from what we had on paper. And that's actually part of our job description. Look at those potential clinical trials and help the patient decide what is appropriate and what is not. So why some patients don't want to participate in clinical trials? Sometimes because of the myth of guinea pig. So the guinea pig is because, of course, actually we have an experimental agent. We don't know everything, side effects first, or if the patient is going to, you know, respond or not to the clinical trial. However, I would like actually to change this term for what I think that is a better one that is receiving the highest level of care available, receiving actually the most qualified healthcare, uh, you know, by the most uh, qualified healthcare professionals. We do this actually, and we enroll in clinical trials after struggling with the experimental agents, trying to learn as much as possible. We want to help our patients. We never want to hurt them. The placebo issue. That almost went away in re uh, uh, clinical trials these days. However, some clinical trials offer the patient the base standard of care. And in addition, the experimental uh, arm may be the standard of care plus experimental agent. So by those parameters, the patient receiving experimental uh, the patient receiving the standard of care treatment is receiving placebo because he's not getting the experimental uh, therapy, but still is not receiving, meaning placebo, a sub-standard treatment. He's receiving at least the best possible that we know at this point. Now, switching doctors or treatment centers can be hard. Sometimes I actually have to send patients as far as Boston, or, um, you know, Houston or other centers around the country. Um, and it's, it's painful. It's painful because the patient has to uh, detach for the doctor that sometimes has been taking care of the patient for a long time, the nurses, their family, etc. And finally, the extra associated cost. We are aware of all of that. 
and we are trying to make participation in clinical trials easiest for the patient. Suspicion or distrust. Well, there is historical events we are all aware have led some groups, mainly minority, uh, to be suspicious of the medical profession. Well, again, one more time since the 70s or before, there has been radical difference in the execution of clinical trials. This kind of, um, you know, if you want almost unethical uh, con uh, conduct of clinical trials doesn't exist anymore. Lack of communication about clinical trials, it could be both ways. It may be actually because we don't tell the patient that there are clinical trials that apply to them, or because when the patient is on the clinical trial, we are not enough straightforward. And finally, the last ditch treatment. And that applies mainly to the phase one. Some patients actually come to me and said, well, I know this is it. If I fail this clinical trial, I don't have anything else to try. Usually that is not the case, because if you fail this first one clinical trial and you are lucky enough that your performance status, your general condition is still good enough, you can go into a standard of care or another phase one clinical trial. This is a physician from Fox Chase Cancer Center. He's a gastric cancer specialist, Dr. Dellinger. I spend a lot of time talking to my colleagues in other centers to find trials for my patients. And they send us patients when we have a study that is good option for their patients. No one place can have trials for everyone. Sometimes my patients think I'm abandoning them when I suggest they leave me to be part of a trial. I always reassure them that I'm doing what is best for them and that they can always come back. Just to give you an example, I see patients from all over the state of Georgia for phase one clinical trials with our um, research team. And um, we suggest the patient, we encourage the patient to continue seeing the physician who refer uh, the patient to see us. That way the patient feels like, uh, he's, you know, is getting a, a, a better care, a care actually from the medical oncologist he or she is familiar with sometimes for years and us that we are conducting the clinical trial. Uh, this is another uh, quote for another physician. I treated a lot of minority patients with cancer on trials. I know that I, um, when I talk to a patient, I'm talking to the family and the community and I have to be aware of the factors that cause people not to trust doctors or clinical trials. I need to take the time to sit down and work through these issues. We are all conscious of this, and this is what we do day in and day out. Why should we all participate in clinical trials? Because it gives us hope, the patients, the family, the physicians, the investigators, because it's getting access to the newest, the most innovative and many times better therapies. Excellent care and monitoring, usually is part of the clinical trial, is a chance to have your voice heard. And because it's a contribution to the greater good and a better future for cancer patients and patients in general. This is I, a lung cancer patient. I choose the trial because I really hope it could help my cancer, but also because I feel very strongly that I was doing something important for others. If it didn't work for me, it could help somebody else. It could help people in the future. In the future, That meant a lot to me. Many of the patients coming on clinical trial, they express the same sentiment. And we are very thankful for that. Now, communicating with the patient on a clinical trial before during and after they go on the trial is important, but you also have to be open in terms of the option of a clinical trial with a physician. If your doctor doesn't bring it up, you need to ask, make a list of your questions, usually before you come in the office. When you come in the office, you may nervous and you may not remember. Talk to the nurse practitioners, the nurses, the coordinators. They are great resources of information. It's not only the physician or the nurse practitioner. Take time to think about the trial 
And please don't hesitate to get a second opinion. We love second opinions. It's a way for the patient to learn and for the physicians. New models of clinical trial. There are different types of cancers that share the same therapeutic target. So not in the future, but now in some academic centers, patients, for instance, with lung cancer and gastric cancer and breast cancer are seen by the same physicians. And you may say, huh, how can be actually the same physician and expert in breast cancer, gastric, or lung? Well, it's not the disease, but it's the genomic alteration, it's the mutation the cancers may have. They are treated all with the same target agent. The same may apply to immunotherapy. So if you are a gastric cancer patient and they refer you what you know seems to be a breast cancer clinic, that may be what it is. And the person that is going to treat you is an expert in the mutation that your type of cancer carries. Improving patient participation by simplification of eligibility, improving the trial design, more effective therapies available, and more input from patients and advocates. We didn't have this much in the past. Now, even the conception of the clinical trial includes the participation of patients. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to leave it uh, there and I'm going to take any questions or any comments if you have any. Thank you. I'll get it back to Anila. So uh, thank you, Dr. Bardoni, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions from our attendees. Um, I would like to go ahead and start with the first question. Um, you mentioned initially how uh, you showed the data and discussed the contribution of different patient population from the different ethnicities, how the minority patient population uh, is mostly not taking part in the clinical trials. Um, what efforts do you and your team undertake to ensure that we are providing everything from our side so patient uh, is feeling comfortable with the clinical trial participation, especially if it's, uh, if it's to do with medical jargon or communication barrier? That is a very good question, is by targeting those specific minority populations. At Northside Hospital Cancer Institute, we have a special interest in targeting those populations. We are lucky actually because the network of Northside Hospital is so huge, actually covers about 65, 70% of the surface of the state. So we know because we understand, because we have studied where those populations live. And then we go there and we target them. When they come actually in our clinics, our nurse navigators, that is actually a term that I didn't use during the presentation and I should. Nurse navigators actually have become a very important source, a very important tool to reach out to different populations, in particular minorities. When then identify minority patients, one by one, they approach them and they approach them in a little different way because through education, through explanation, through <clears throat> examples, recent examples in the last 25, 30 or more years of minorities participating in clinical trials and see how the data that we are drawing on minority groups apply to them specifically to improve their outcome, survival, et cetera. That is one effective way that we are utilizing. I know the, you know, the work um, is, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15% done. We need to do much more than that. But I can tell you, I have been doing this now since I came to this country in 85, and this is like day and night. Even clinical trials, specific clinical trials have in the design of the clinical trial, how to approach minority groups. That never happened 10, 15 or more years ago. So that's the way we target them and I feel successfully. I would also like to add to that, Dr. Bardoni, that when we have a patient uh, from, a, from a minority patient population, we do ensure that we have a translator in place um, so that patients feeling comfortable and, and able to understand everything that we are um, the care that we that they'll be receiving from us. And then in addition, we also translate our ICFs, our informed consent, so that they have an option to read it and review it 
with the family before they are able to make a decision. So hopefully uh, that's also contributing towards making a fair decision and entering into the clinical trials. Okay, uh, another question is, if I enroll in a clinical trial out of state, do I need to transfer to a local oncologist or can I expect to maintain my current healthcare team? You can uh, keep your healthcare team. However, if that clinical trial is not open in a place close to home, well, you may have actually to travel back and forth. Something that we do very often. Let me give you an example. MD Anderson, MD Anderson in Houston is a very well-known um, research institution for cancer, just for cancer. We refer many patients to them. They actually administer the experimental treatment. They may do actually some experimental studies, etc. But the standard of care management of that patient may be done by us, the original team taking care of the patient locally. So the patient actually may be 70% of the care um, is delivered locally and 30% of the experimental is delivered actually in Houston, for instance. But we work as a team. Are there any general factors that may make me ineligible for a clinical trial? Gender factors. Um, I would like to say no, and I, I, I want actually to acknowledge the tremendous improvement in the last uh, 40, 50 years. So this is nothing new. I mean, we don't differentiate by gender, but in some specific situations, gender is a very important component of the type of cancer. So it's not a matter of discrimination. It's just a matter of, you know, that the disease, you know, there is a prevalence in some specific population. Thyroid cancer being an example is, you know, is, is much more common in, in female patients than in male patients. It's much more common in uh, young female patients than in elderly uh, women. So because of that, actually, there is not gender discrimination. It's just a matter of the characteristics of the cancer. Otherwise, no, there is no gender discrimination at this point in time. What about any other general factors? Any other factors that you believe that would make patient ineligible for the clinical trial besides gender? Yeah, I, as I mentioned before, the most important one that we deal with every day, and actually this morning before this talk, is comorbid conditions, is other conditions. And unfortunately, some of these comorbid conditions are more common in some minorities. For instance, African American in this country, they have um, increased um, hypertension, increased rate of diabetes mellitus, and part of that actually may be because obesity is more common in African American. Well, some patients are actually African American come to my office and they are ready to go on a clinical trial. But if they don't have a diabetes mellitus that can be controlled or the systemic arterial hypertension, sometimes actually we cannot put the patient on the clinical trial because of the medication they need to take. But more than that, because it may be risky to put a patient on an experimental agent that we don't have much experience, how may uh, behave in a patient with high blood pressure that cannot be controlled or high blood sugar that cannot be controlled. So that is the most common by far reason for exclusion of patients in clinical trials. The other one is the performance titles. So mainly actually with phase one, phase two clinical trials, those are patients that actually have received two, three or more lines of therapy. By then, because of the side effects of prior lines of therapy, those patients may not uh, be fit enough to participate in clinical trials. Usually participation in trials, as I mentioned before, requires a performance status, what we call zero or one, according to the ECOG scale. And many patients are one or two, two disqualifies them. But that is, you know, reasonable. It's not any kind of discrimination. One more time, if the patient is not strong enough for a standard treatment, is less uh, qualified to take an experimental treatment that one more time, we don't know how is going to impact 
their well-being? Let's see. Um, there are a couple of other questions that I would like to ask you. If treatment from the clinical trial works for my condition, will I be able to continue taking it after I've completed the study? If the clinical trial is improving your condition, is having actually a positive impact on your condition, usually, yes. There are two options. When the clinical trial is complete, one of them is because the experimental agent is already FDA approved, and then you just switch from the clinical trial dispenses the experimental treatment to the pharmacy dispenses the standard of care treatment and your uh, insurance company most likely will cover it. The other possibility is that it's not FDA approved, but if it is benefiting you in particular, you are deriving actually some kind of benefit, usually the sponsor continues providing you uh, on a kind of, uh, uh, you know, exception, uh, you know, uh, continue uh, giving you the experimental agent. We have seen that in many, many cases, patients actually that are the only patient that continues uh, on the experimental while the clinical trial is totally uh, completed and the experimental agent is not yet approved. And really uh, connected to that question, if the clinical trial fails to improve my cancer, uh, can I go back to receiving any other forms of treatment? Yes, and that is a very important point. When you actually go on the clinical trial, unfortunately, uh, there are a specific eligibility conditions so or criteria. So for instance, some clinical trials are for patients that went through one or two lines of therapy, that's it. So if you are beyond one line or beyond two lines of therapy, you may not qualify for that clinical trial. However, after you participate in the clinical trial and because of intolerance of the experimental agent or because the tumor escapes the control of the experimental agent, yes, you can go back to your primary medical oncologist and you can continue receiving a standard of care treatment if there are a standard of care treatment still available. So the answer is yes. And that is a very important question because some uh, patients, unfortunately, come in the office and they say, well, this is it. No, this is not it. Even a standard of care may be still available to you after the trial. Great, and I believe I have the last question here. After being put on pause due to COVID-19, have clinical trials resumed as usual? Say it again. After being put on pause due to COVID-19, have clinical trials resumed as usual? Um, yes, we are getting actually to that point. Of course, when the pandemic started, everybody, not only the patients, the family, the physician, we were very careful to travel, to have contact with other people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So clinical trials slow down. And one of the reasons clinical trials for cancer and other conditions slow down is because we gave priorities to COVID-19 clinical trials. It was a healthcare emergency. We were in the middle of a crisis. For instance, in our institution, Northside Hospital, the um, clinical trials that open in the field of COVID-19, I think that they were close to 40 or 50. Of course, actually, there is a very large number of clinical trials occupies the time and the effort of the whole research um, uh, you know, staff in our institution. But you know, for nine months or so, that was the priority. Between nine and 12 months into the pandemic, slowly the um, uh, you know, vaccines and some other treatments, they were already proven effective. And because of that, we started slowly coming back to the uh, oncology and some other clinical trials as priority. Right now, in terms of oncology, we are pretty much at full speed, like we were before the pandemic or even more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bordoni, for the great presentation and answering so many important questions. 
I would like to reinvite Katie for uh, the wrap up and closing remarks, please. Thank you, Anila, and thank you, Dr. Bordoni, for today's presentation, such helpful information. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for your questions. I do want to encourage anybody who would like additional information about clinical trials, uh, you can visit either northside.com or you can email the Northside Hospital Research Program, and that's clinical period trials at northside.com. As we wrap up, I do want to Throw it back to Dr. Bordoni and Anila if you have any kind of closing remarks you'd like to share. For me, the closing remark actually will be uh, research clinical trials equal hope and also actually equals progress. So remember actually that analogy uh, while you are thinking about participation in clinical trials. Anila? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity, Dr. Bardoni. It was a great presentation. I hope it was useful for a lot of audi audiences that joined the call today. Uh, we definitely look forward to connecting with cancer support community for events like these in the near future. Thank you for the opportunity again, Katie. And thank you both so much for being so generous with your time and expertise. A recording of today's program will be available on Cancer Support Community Atlanta's website. Again, that's cscatlanta.org. So if you'd like to refer to that in the future, you'll find that under the videos tab. All right. Well, thank you both again for joining us today. Everybody have a great afternoon and uh, we hope you have a good weekend. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org, or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.